Hello, this is Dr. Joel B. Gooden with Driven to Doctorate. Today I have with me Dr. Lindsay Wright. How are you, Lindsay? Great, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming in. Uh, we we had a little mix up with Zoom and then we finally made it work. Here we are. Um, so I told you I was considering an app, so I had to re-wake myself up. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we made this happen. Um, you're somebody I work with every day, so to speak, but since we work online, I don't pass you in the hallway and I really haven't gotten to know you. So this is dual purpose. Other people get to know you. I get to know you a little bit. Um, and so usually I start out with sort of origin stories. Um, you know, just like, tell me where, where did you come from? Where, where were you born? Anything like that, that you're, uh, you know, willing to sort of say, you know, where you, where you grew up? Sure. Um, I grew up in upstate New York. Um, and by upstate New York, I mean like Adirondacks, not like, okay. you know, um, I can't even think of the counties right above New York City but way north in actual yeah. upstate New York and not Western New York, like Buffalo, like actual upstate. Okay. Um, and now I live in Massachusetts um, and I've lived here for 10 or more years. And yeah. Cool, cool. Um, that, that sounds good. So is, is that up near Maine, I'm guessing? Is uh, no, well, is there no. like a state between <laughs> New York and Maine, probably? Uh, yes, New Hampshire and Vermont are New like Twitter. above me and next to Maine. I am so Massachusetts is here, and then you have New Hampshire and Vermont, and okay. then below is Connecticut and Rhode Island, and then New York is right next to me. So I need, I need a, a globe in my back, my new background. <laughs> I was telling Dr. Wright that. I just made a false wall behind my behind me because I I was showing everybody my kitchen, so um, I put some bookshelves there. I've got to like make them all look nice, and then we'll make it look it real. So so you're you've got it. I down mean the so bookshelves far. are real. I just had to move <laughs> them there, and it looks like uh, a real office. Maybe um, maybe I'll even put my diplomas up. Who knows? <laughs> um, so I was going to ask you, uh, so um, obviously you've got a PhD. I have a PsyD. PsyD. So mm -hmm. I was wrong. Um, okay. It's not the first time today. Um, so a PsyD in forensic psych? Clinical psychology. Okay. All right. I'll just let you explain. Uh, I was going to ask you about your background in education, uh, sort of like how you got to the point where you're at. Sure. Um, so uh, I went to a state school for undergrad. Um, originally, I was going to be, um, I don't know what I was going to be actually, um, but I wanted to grow up and be a field hockey coach. So I originally went to school for phys ed. Um, and then I was bored. So <laughs> I switched to psychology, um, which uh, I would definitely say is the last thing I ever thought I would switch to, but somehow got interested. Um, and then I went straight from my undergrad program into my doctoral program. Mm -hmm. um, and my doctorate is in clinical psychology. Um, when I went to grad school, I also thought I was going to grow up and be a neuropsychologist. Um, and so most of my training was in neuropsych. Um, and then just before I um, finish my program, you do an internship, and I was in a consortium, and the consortium had like all these rotations, and then suddenly they were like, oh, we're gonna have this new rotation at the prison, and I was like, what the heck, it's my last chance as an intern to just try something out, um, and then I loved it, um, uh -huh. and not be, I don't want to say not because of inmates, but I, like, I actually don't like scary things, which is um, sort of a random tidbit, so people are like, oh, watch this horror movie. And I'm like, no, I'll have nightmares. Um, yeah. uh, but I liked working, I liked prison because uh, like neuropsychology, it's like a puzzle that you have to figure out. Um, it's just a different puzzle. Um, and so I really liked the puzzle that 
it encompasses forensic psychology. Um, and so then I, I, you know, graduated and was hired where I had my internship at a prison and just sort of went from there. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to add to our list because I think it's important. Even I, I hate to say, I don't know something. Uh, anytime. I really hate saying I don't know X, you know, <laughs> insert anything, but I especially don't know. And I think a lot of people don't know, or they have a misconstrued maybe understanding of what forensic psych uh, psychologists do. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you about that. So you worked for the prison. How did you make it to North Central? Um, Let's see, I worked for prisons for 10 years. I worked at federal prisons and state prisons. Uh, then I left because I don't like working for the government um, <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, and although I loved what I did, um, I just didn't like the governing organization. Um, and then I worked in a forensic hospital. Um, and somewhere in there I started teaching. Um, like I probably needed extra money. <laughs> it was like, oh, well, I'll teach as an adjunct. And I was teaching like live classes and then um, uh, I can't even think. Uh, some online classes just through like a community college or something. And they were okay. Like it was an okay job. And I think I did teach some forensic psychology. Um, and then um, at North Central was starting their MS programs and forensic psychology was actually the first MS program that was started. And uh, they were looking for a subject matter expert. And so I was hired for that. Um, and I just sort of, it just sort of developed from there. Like I did that and then I was adjunct and now I'm full-time faculty. Um, so yeah. Right. right, we were talking about this just before uh, we hit record. Uh, you've been here since 2015. Yep. Um, was that when you went part time, and then you became full time after that, or was that? When um, it was. It was a very quick succession, I would say. Like I probably okay. worked as a subject matter expert for like four to six months, um, developing a bunch of the courses that are in the program, and then was hired as adjunct either in 2015 or 2016, I don't know. And sometime in 2016, I became full-time faculty. So it was pretty quick. I just don't remember the exact timeline. They, they wanted to test you out, make sure they <laughs> like you. So that's great. Um, and and so now you teach, are, do you do, are you the program lead for forensic? Yep. yep, I'm the program lead and the internship coordinator. Um, we do actually have one other full-time faculty in forensic, um, unlike any of the other partners, just because we're so big at this point. Um, we actually also have uh, like 13 faculty members that are primarily forensic. So. Wow. I didn't see, I didn't know this. Um, so I, I want to ask about that, but first I want to say, okay, I think tell, tell us all, me, uh, in this case, what is forensic psychology? Explain it so that we don't have like misunderstandings anymore. Um, well, it's not what you see on CSI. Okay. Not um, it is not like hunting down criminals um, in the way that people think it is. Um, it is the intersection of psychology and the law. So it is often related to mental health treatment or assessment um, for those who are involved in, in the legal system. Um, I see a lot of students, I mean, I get all sorts of questions like, oh, are we going to do autopsies in this program? Or am I going to like, I want to hunt down the criminals and get into their mind. And I'm like, you're not going to do that because that's what police do. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean you profile can't. serial killers. Um, no, I mean, you, so we get a lot of students who think that, um, it doesn't mean that's impossible, but, um, in the department of justice, so the jobs that people think of when they think of these things like the BAU or, um, even like I work for the Bureau of Prisons and they have a WITSEG program, uh, witness security, I guess is what it's called. 
Um, and basically the number of psychologists who do that is like, I can probably count them on one hand. So like, <laughs> so if you want that job, you gotta be really lucky to get it. And the people who get them, have them for a long time. Um, is that counseling people that have to go into witness security? Um, they do like the security. So the WITSEG psychologists, there's two of them. They've been in those positions for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, they like do this psychology, psychological testing and um, make sure they're like, can, can do it. We'll be able to, you know, follow the rules, um, decide who's eligible, decide what mental health services they need, I imagine, things like that. I don't know all of it because I'm not you know, one of them, but, right. but I do know that there's two of them and they've been in their roles for at least 20 years. So, <laughs> um, but, but it doesn't mean that we don't do certain things that um, are around that area. So I do uh, violence and sexual and threat assessment. And so okay. some of that um, includes things that are similar to profiling. I also used to do hostage negotiation. And so that uh, involves an element of profiling, but not like what you see on, you know, criminal minds. It's a little different, more applicable. <laughs> I will tell my parents um, <laughs> and what they watch on CSI and criminal minds is not, tr not, not necessarily right. true. Yeah. Not what you do. There's limited validity in it. Um, right, right. So, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Right, but that's not, you'd say that maybe like a percentage, a small percentage of what you could do with this, with a PhD in forensic or something. Yeah, it's, like it's, it's very unlikely that that's what you would actually do. Um, it's more likely that you consult after the fact, after they've found an offender or you know who the subject is and you are being asked to do something. Um, provide some information, assess something, uh, like in a hostage negotiation scenario, the psychologist does profiling in the sense that they get all the records of this person and then tell the people who they're working with, you know, like, you know, how to work with someone who maybe they're psychotic, maybe like, you know, you look at all the information and sort of try and give them ways to effectively work with the person. Right. Okay. Okay, I, I think I've got a better idea. Well, what, what do you do in, let's say, while you were working in the prison, what were some things that you would do? Um, um, so in the prison setting, um, the way I would best describe it is psychologists spend their time um, helping the people that are in there deal with the situation that they're in. You're not like getting into the mind of the criminal to see why they did the act. A lot of people say that. And it's like, they're not, I mean, they're still people. Um, so we're not like, you know, researching them. Some people do that. Some people who are researchers, usually they work for universities, uh -huh. do some of that type of research or people who maybe work for some of the federal agencies who are, you know, conducting research studies. Maybe they do those things, but the people who actually work in the prisons don't really do that. They do, um, I would describe it as triage <laughs> um, in some treatments. So I've worked in um, general facilities where uh, there's sort of programming going on. I've worked in facilities that um, it's like an intake facility. So every inmate that's coming into the prison system has to go through this facility and they have to be classified for their mental health needs. Mm -hmm. And I've worked in um, hospitals like psychiatric hospitals inside of prisons with inmates who are like too dangerous due to their mental illness to be released. So a broad spectrum of stuff. And a lot of the work was um, not much assessment as far as like treatment, more like quick assessment, a lot of suicide risk assessment and dangerousness assessment, um, but also basically putting out fires. So when you work in a prison, every day is different. You don't really know what's going to happen. Um, one day, maybe you're running to a housing unit to, you know, evacuate inmates because there's a fire because some inmates set a fire in their cell. One day, maybe you are um, working as a correctional officer on a housing unit because they don't have enough staff that day. So you have to go down and be the correctional officer all day and do rounds and all of those things. Or, uh, 
or there's an inmate in a hallway who is naked and will not get dressed and they think he's psychotic. So you have to go down there and coax that inmate into putting his clothes back on so everyone can go about their business. <laughs> so, I mean, it's different every single day. <laughs> um, I'm hearing that it's not as glamorous as some people might think. It's not as glamorous, but it, I mean, if, if it is an environment that you don't mind, um, like some people get really uncomfortable with the idea that you're locked inside or that you're with criminals. Um, it's a really, I think it's a really fun place to work. Um, a lot of different things happen. Um, I mean, you just cannot make up stories of the things that happen in prison every day. Um, but you have to be okay with sort of being in the setting. Um, some people, when I talk to people about, oh, I'm scared to work there. Sorry, I've got a cat. <laughs> who won't like, stop bothering me. Um, people say that they're so scared of it. And I think, but in prison, you know all the information about this person. You know what they did. You know how they did it. You have all that information. Also, you know the likelihood of whether they're going to be carrying a weapon, which is pretty much minimal. And you also have like security features, like maybe a foot pedal to get security there, or there's constant rounds or whatever. Whereas in the community, you have no idea what's walking in your door and there's no one right there to save you. So <laughs> I think it's safer in prison, but that's just right. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I think. Um, so obviously you don't have to have a PhD in forensic psychology to do this job. Mm -hmm. You've got a PsyD in clinical. Are a lot of the people that, that do that type of work, do they have um, some sort of degree in clinical? Um, most are clinical um, or counseling psychologists um, okay. because you need to have clinical expertise because usually it involves diagnostics type okay. stuff and treatment type, type stuff. So um, most people have doctorates, but you don't have to. Um, prisons and jails are really interesting in that one, there's always opportunities for employment. Um, like they're always looking for people. Um, and so they are different as far as who they'll let work places. So for example, um, one place I worked, uh, social workers and psychologists did the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, or they will hire people with a bachelor's degree who to sort of work their way up the chain. And now they've somehow landed themselves as a treatment specialist, even if they maybe haven't had clinical experience or, um, or you don't have to be licensed either. Um, so as long as there's one person who's licensed, the rest of the people who are working under them do not have to be. So it's a little bit wide ranging, but, uh, but actually one of the psychologists who worked in my department was an educational psychologist. Um, she had a PhD, um, definitely not a clinical PhD, but somehow she was doing treatment and stuff with the substance abuse program. So right. <laughs> she was not trained to do probably. Unless, I mean, uh, maybe I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, maybe at, at a master's level, but yeah, Ed Psych doesn't train you to do that, right. um, which is, in case you're watching, that's not, uh, that. that's what I do, I'm the program lead for Ed Psych, Dr. Wright's the program lead for forensic, and so she does her thing, and mine's a lot different, so um, so getting back to the program that we offer, the master's, so what can you do with the, the master's in forensic, in forensic site? A lot of things. Um, you can work, I mean, one of the things I first say is like, you can be a, a, like a supervisor in any of these roles. So like if you're working in probation or parole, it might qualify you for a higher job. If you work in a prison, um, you can work as like a case manager. Um, you can work. Uh, as a treatment specialist, um, you can work, oh, I'm trying to think, uh, risk assessment is a big area that master's folks work in. Um, so as I said before, I do uh, threat and risk assessment. And when I go to trainings um, for it, I'm usually the only person there with a doctorate. Um, almost everyone else there is master's or lower. And because of whatever job they do, they're basically forced to do these risk assessments. And so they have to be trained to do it. So as with a master's degree, um, 
that's something you can do as well. Okay, so lots of opportunities with the math. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, I was wondering, okay, so why is it, it seems it must be popular. Um, what in your in your opinion, or maybe you know, why is it so popular? Is are we getting people from the prison system that want to sort of uh, excel or be promoted, or, or what, who's your who's the market for this master's in forensics? Um, I think it's both. I think we get a lot of people who are already in the field. Um, today, I met with a student who is a police detective, and she's mm -hmm. looking to retire and move into a different field. Um, I actually have a couple of like people in law enforcement who are either looking to excel their career or do something after they retire because law enforcement retirement is after 20 years. So they can sort of do a whole new career. Um, but also a lot of students who are just like, this is cool. Like I want to get into the mind of a criminal or see what they do. And so there's just this fascination, which is why there's so many TV shows that sort of delve into this sort of, it's just this fascination um, with uh, forensic psychology that I think brings probably half of our students besides the ones who are actually already in the field somehow. Oh, how many students do you think you disappoint when you have this <laughs> conversation of like, here's what we really do? Um, I mean, ideally marketing, we, I mean, we work a lot with, I work a lot with marketing to right. try and make that not happen. <laughs> um, but I can tell you today, like just before this, I was giving feedback to a student who thought they were gonna like go out and catch the bad guys and like find dead bodies. <laughs> like, no, that's not what's gonna happen. Um, I, I think a lot of students recognize the interest in it anyways, um, because it, it's pretty fascinating. Um, I, I don't think I've broken a ton of hearts recently about what it is and what we're doing. I, I feel like maybe we're doing a better job of being really clear with students up front what it is and what it isn't. I know I've done videos for marketing and all sorts of stuff so that this doesn't happen, mm -hmm. but it happens. Um, and yeah, so. Right, right. And that's sort of our job to work with marketing and make, and <laughs> our recruiters and sort of say, Here's what we can't do. Or here's, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. to clarify that. Um, so um, sort of this, this series of interviews typically is about sort of dissertations. And I know um, we were talking about sort of that um, you, you mainly just work as a subject matter expert and are not real like knee deep into all of that work. Um, mm -hmm. There's something you have to share like in terms of the doctoral program or grad program, master's or doctoral that you think our, our audience could benefit from? Sure. Um, I think the biggest piece is just understanding that faculty are here to teach you and support you. Mm -hmm. um, I know that seems really obvious, but I, I just don't, think it is. Um, I regularly, uh, so I teach a lot of students in the very beginning of their program um, who are like, what am I doing? How do I get here? Oh my gosh, I just failed this, an assignment or my kid is sick and now I'm already late with an assignment and they're all ready to like throw it out the door in the first few seconds. Um, and just sort of understanding that like our job as faculty is to teach and be supportive in any role that we have. So whether that's dissertation or doing other courses um, and to sort of take that in. Um, sometimes I, I see in uh, writing or work um, that students like to share their own opinion about like something. And I see a lot and I understand like we all have our own opinions. But one thing I sort of try to say to students or help them think about it is you came to school to learn not to like tell me what you think is, you know, the prevailing idea about this. You came to actually learn what it is. And so now I'm asking you to go to those resources and learn and then share it in your assignments or your dissertation or whatever. Um, but the same thing goes with like when we're teaching or getting feedback from faculty is um, we're teaching. So if I'm not 
teaching you how to do something different or giving you more content, then I'm not teaching you anything. And that's why you're here. And I think that's a hard part for students to sort of take in is like feedback and like how, like they just, sometimes it's just like, no, I'm right, you're wrong. It's like, but you're here to learn. <laughs> so my job is to teach. And so that's what I'm doing. So that when you get out of here, you know, you look really awesome and professional and you figured it all out and you're using scholarly information in an appropriate way. Right. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest thing that I would say is important. <laughs> no, I think that's really good. Um, and that's another way to sort of say it. Um, I normally just say, um, you know, we don't really want your opinion. Um, <laughs> it, that that's, it's probably true, but we can't prove that it's true. You know, I approach it a little differently. And so, um, yeah, I think I, I like I like that strategy as well to say, you, you're paying this university, which pays me a little bit of that money to actually teach you things I know. And not so that you can just, every assignment, you can tell me the things you already know <laughs> and all the experiences you've had. And, that does neither of us any good, right? Right. Um, so I, I think that's interesting. Um, I use the same tactic, by the way, as that you just described also like in papers of like, oh, you know, I bet this is true, but where did you read it? <laughs> like, prove it, demonstrate this is true. Like, maybe it's true, yeah, maybe not, whole, I don't know. <laughs> and you've, I, I bet you've been in court. Um, I haven't, but I always use the court example. Like, well, where's your evidence? If you were like in front of a judge or a jury, you know, how would you explain, here's the proof of the things I'm trying to say in my paper, um, you know, as, and you'd present this evidence and this piece of evidence and you'd say, look at this mound of evidence <laughs> I've put together. And, and so I'm, you're proving your point. You're making a rational argument and it's based on facts, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's actually a really good point that I'm now going to steal for my forensic psychology oh, students. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> well, that's because right. we do expert testimony, so that's like a really, right, right. like it really applies to forensic psychology. <laughs> right, I was, I was saying you, you yeah. probably have been in court. I've never been in court. I just watch TV shows. Not yeah. so much criminal minds, but um, <laughs> but my parents do. Um, and that's um, so. Yeah, no, it's it's really important that that the students have sort of that growth mindset of like, I want to learn. I, I, you know, instead of just performance. How do I get an A? How do I get this paper done? Mm -hmm. And every week. I swear the most common feedback is, I want you to engage more with the material. You, you looked like, you know, you looked like you were in a hurry when you wrote this <laughs> and you probably were. And if it wasn't, you were in a hurry, it was, you maybe didn't care very much and you didn't really read all the readings that were assigned. And then you got to the assignment and sort of didn't have a whole lot to say. And, so, and that's why you didn't reach that minimum page limit or whatever. So yeah, it's just sort of that attitude of, did you come here to learn or did you just come here to sort of, a lot of people, in fact, I got a student, um, I, you know, you talk about putting out fires. I had a student last night email me, yeah, I'm paying for these classes. I'm like, yes. yes. <laughs> and he he actually pointed out where I had I had told him, you can resubmit by Wednesday. And then we had had another conversation where I had told him, oh yeah, you know, he had explained life circumstances. And I had said, oh, Sunday will be fine, you know, if you need extra time, you know. But I hadn't put that in my notes, you know, in the feedback. <laughs> and so when he resubmitted his feedback after my original due date, I looked like a jerk because I was like, hey, I offered you a resubmission, but it was due on this date. And I was like, so 
too bad. And he was like, <laughs> yeah, so angry. And I just emailed him back. I owe you an apology. What's your phone number? <laughs> so, and, and we talked for a minute and I was like, I, you know, I just said, seems like I messed up. <laughs> he had gotten, his email was all worked up. I pay for these classes, you know, and some people take that a step further and say, I pay for these classes, where's my degree? And they have that mindset and they're not, some of them are really not uh, motivated to engage in the learning. Um, and so that's really part of it. We, if, whether Even if you did come just to sort of pay, work your way through the courses, get your degree, we're gonna make you learn along the way as well as we can. Um, so. I think it helps. I think it helps to, I do a lot of engagement type things, not just like with students. I do it with faculty as well, but like, um, it, so uh, as a practice, I, I don't do this all the time, but I started doing it probably a couple months ago of like when, when a student is struggling, instead of saying like, if you want to talk about it, let me know. Instead, I send them an email and I'm like, set up a meeting. <laughs> like, right. I don't really make it, not that it's not optional, but I just sort of make it like, I really want to help you. And so we should meet and make mm -hmm. this happen. And so we can understand the material and actually talk. Um, particularly, I, like I said, I teach a lot of students in the first course of the program. Um, like at any given time, I'm probably teaching 30 to 40 students in the intro to forensic psych class. Mm -hmm. So, which is a lot. Um, and a lot of times they're like ready to run out the door before anything has happened. And so I have to like bring them back in and like engage with them and just sort of remind them why they're here and that they're learning and, you know, just to sort of keep moving forward, um, progress, not perfection. <laughs> so. Right. Right. Do you get a lot of, I've never made a, a F before or a C or whatever it is? Oh, yes. Um, I would say, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm a hard grader, but I have standards just like the rest of the right. faculty. Um, like I have a district, I like have a doctorate. So like I had to meet these standards to get this degree. And so I expect certain standards for master's level students, but I also um, really focus on progress and learning. And so um, when I do fail a student, um, particularly in the early courses or on, on an assignment, I actually try to reach out and just be like, hey, I'd love to talk about this and teach you what's missing here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I give it in feedback as well, like in the assignments, but I find that um, when you just fail a student um, and just try the feedback, that doesn't often work out really well. Um, and it causes them to disengage and not want to learn or not understand what's happening. Um, and so I try to use those as opportunities to grow. It doesn't mean that they're going to pass the assignment um, unless I allow for resubmission, but it does mean that I'm going to like try and teach them what is happening. Um, Cause sometimes students just don't learn through just like, so I give written feedback in the assignments and I give video feedback, let's say, 80% of the time I give video feedback. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of students that doesn't work, like teaching a student how to do in-text citations and paraphrasing and reference lists, it doesn't matter what resources I give. If a student doesn't know how to do that, I don't really find that they get it until I actually meet with them and piece by piece explain, like even the concepts we were talking about before, <laughs> like prove it, <laughs> put in the citations. Um, I'm just, I, I find that students who are saying the things like you said about like, oh, um, I've never failed something before. Mm. Okay. Maybe you didn't have as the standards were different where you came from. And now I'm going to teach you, like, I'm going to bring you to a new standard. That's going to make you really awesome as a professional and in your career. So maybe it sucks to get an F, but in the long run, the goal will be, is to teach you and get you to a place where you're doing really awesome um, and you can see how much you've grown through the program, which is again, why you are here to learn. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Um, and I think I'll use more of that 
that's just something to remind me to, you know, that I can just reach out for a meeting. Because I think, you know, when there's, there's some, you know, when they're feeling like that, they're scared, they may be ashamed, uh, they're scared of like getting kicked out, they're scared, you know, all sorts of negative feelings. Like, they, and I'm like, well, first of all, I just wrote that, you know, like say it's a six point assignment. And they, they sort of like totally, you know, missed, didn't even like address two of the things it asked you to do. Let's say there are six things. See how I got your grade? It was four out of six. And guess yeah. what a four out of six is? With us, it's an F, mm -hmm. right? So, and I was like, I didn't put in the letter but I know that you saw it and I know it hurts, but you've still got like 98 points available in the course, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think reaching out and sort of offering that, I normally offer a resubmission and I do the video feedback as well. Um, but I think a few more, even like a 10 minute, 30 minute phone call, you know, sometimes they last a while. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, that's an excellent idea. Um, and probably really helps with retention. Um, um, so yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to integrate that more. Um, it's hard when, you know, when you're busy, you're like, oh, but I don't want another meeting today. <laughs> Um, I mean, it helps. I don't know what your schedule is like. So like, I only meet with students on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. Okay. For, so like I have a, an automatic calendar and people schedule appointments by themselves through the link and that's it. And I have an open house. Actually, I should clarify. I have a one hour open house a week that people can just drop into. Um, but outside of that, I don't like, I don't meet with students unless it's like emergent and I didn't have time or like, you know, whatever. But usually it just falls in those windows. So that way it doesn't take over my entire life. <laughs> right. No, I, I get it. Um, and it's not going to take over my life. Um, I, I think, I think that's really, that's a really good strategy and I can do that. Um, it also stops me from having to email back and forth a thousand times to set up something. I just say, click on the link and you'll have a meeting. Yeah, I may follow up with you about setting. setting <laughs> up. I think I saw Dr. Coleman had something like that. So I, I need to know uh, how to do that. Um, so was there anything else you wanted to share with sort of students and say, I also think you should know this. Any, anything else that was on your mind? Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like I shared what I wanted to share. I, I would say just, um, I don't know if this is the part where I was going to share the stuff about um, like professional organization stuff. I don't right. Know. Yeah, I was about to get to that. I was going to say, you know, I asked you. Uh, how people can keep up with you. And you were like, they can't, they can't <laughs> find me, I'm hiding. Uh, so you said no social media really going on. And so, yeah, and your picture is not on the NCU website. Yeah, so, I'm kind of under about that. <laughs> um, because I do work in forensic psychology, um, I prefer to not be very visible. Right. Um, on social media or even on like websites with pictures um, because it makes people who maybe I don't want to find me easier able to find me. So if they can find my name with a picture, they're like, oh, that's her. Um, but, right. <laughs> but if it's not there, that's a bit harder. Um, the same with like social media. Um, like I don't have any books or Twitter or anything like that, but I do have social media, but I don't use my, like, I don't, it doesn't say Lindsay Wright. And you're not going to get that out. <laughs> you're not going to find me. It's like um, you have, I don't want to uh, be found. <laughs> it's like you have this big following of ex, creepy ex-boyfriends. I so, mean, uh, yes. I mean, that would be one way to put it. It's more like creepy ex-offenders. Um, 
offenders in this case. Or offenders, yeah. So I just don't do that. But um, what I would say um, that I think is probably a better use of your time than trying to hunt me down <laughs> okay. is being like, look into professional organizations. So like forensic psychology, um, we have APLS, which is the uh, American Psychology and Law Society, which is actually division 41 of the APA. It just has a weird name to it. Um, I feel like the other divisions are named in a different way, but ours is like that. APLS. And then I'm also a member of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. Um, mm -hmm. It's called ATAP. Um, and that is an organization for people who do um, threat assessments, which is like, is what people think about when they think about dangerousness. Um, there's actually many kinds of dangerousness, but threat assessment is um, targeted violence. Um, so like violence that happens against a particular person, like public figure, a polit political person, but it's also like um, bigger, uh, like uh, school shootings, um, those kinds of things. Um, and so the professionals in that field, um, there's definitely psychologists, um, but they're, they are a broad range of professionals. A lot of people in criminal justice, um, law enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. It's a huge, range of people who work in that field but um that's another organization that um has some pretty awesome stuff so great great um yeah i was just thinking i probably need to have i've got a few students doing sort of law enforcement related dissertation um they may have questions for you i don't know I'll, there's also yeah and there's also actually like a number of other criminal justice like um professional organization i couldn't even list them all but there's tons of them and and if people are interested in the master's program at north central they can just call north central and talk to recruiting yes. and, yeah um so thanks i've learned a lot today um and i will no longer be thinking that you were out there with a big spyglass <laughs> uh, tracking clues right like with the Pink Panthers, sort of. <laughs> there's a song playing. I don't know, um, but thank you so much. Um, you you shared a lot. So um, at this time, I, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, this has been Driven to Doctorate with Dr. Dolby Gooden and yes, Dr. Lindsay Wright. Thank you.